taking place, employers have some flexibility there. One of the areas that I think we get into some issues on furlough or reduced hours are if we have employees who are exempt from overtime and the exemption is based in part on that salary basis test, in those situations, typically, you have to pay the employee that salary for the full week, regardless of what hours they're putting in. There are some ways to do that where you can actually switch somebody from an exempt status to a non-exempt status for a short period of time. But these are issues that the employers need to be thinking about and be sensitive to, or they could end up with wage claims down the road as well. Um, I was just thinking- A lot like, of information, no, I know. No, 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 it's great, but these questions matter on whether or not the employer needs to be clear. I'm giving you unpaid leave. I'm putting, I'm furloughing you or I'm laying you off. And those, <clears throat> if they have an AFLAC claim while on unpaid leave, is it while they're employed or not employed? Those sorts of questions are interesting. Questions, are they your, but you're saying if they are furloughed, or placed on unpaid leave, they remain the employee of the organization and the organization's all their obligations to them remain. It depends on how they defined it at the outset. So they do have some flexibility to say which things continue, which don't, what the furlough is going to look like um, because it's outside of their norm. It's not within a normal policy that they have. Um, there will be some organizations perhaps you have a collective bargaining agreement in place. Well, then it will probably ha cover the situation in some way, or there'll be something to bargain about. But for most North Carolina employers dealing with at-will employees, when a situation like this arises, there is flexibility, but you have to go through that process and say, do I have an employment contract with this person? If you have an employment contract, you may be on the hook for things. Um, if you don't have an employment contract, then what do my policies say? Um, so, for example, you may have a policy that says at separation of employment, you pay out any accrued but unused vacation time. So, it needs to be very clear, are you separating employment or not? And if you are not, then can they go ahead and use accrued vacation time during the furlough? Probably they can. Um, if it is something where you pay it out on separation, then it needs to be clearly communicated. It is a separation and you need to make that payout. So analyzing number one, employment agreements, number two, any sort of policies that you have. And then number three, what a lot of people are finding out is I don't have policies that are written for these situations. Right. So we're working with a lot of employers right now who did lay off employees and who are looking at when they come back, I want to have better policies in place because I realized I didn't anticipate a lot of situations that I had to deal with. So we're doing a lot of policy revision in preparation for employers bringing back employees. On the employee side, let's move to in stimulus two um, was this family medical leave that did or didn't apply to, well, it didn't apply to people over 500. It did apply to under 500, but maybe not to under 50. Can you explain? We've had several questions from plumbers and others who have employees who don't want to work because of fear of exposure or have a family member that they need to care for that may have been, you know, what is this new family medical leave and then will they be reimbursed? Can you explain how it works? Okay, that's a big question. Okay, maybe. Um, <laughs> we've done <laughs> some hour long um, <laughs> seminars just covering the basics of it, but I'll try to give you a very short version and then let people ask questions. So, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act contained a lot of things, but two things in it were leave laws. One is an expansion of the Family and Medical Leave Act, 
And what it did is it said for one reason and one reason only, and that is if you are needed to stay home to care for a child because school is closed or daycare is not available, that one reason is a new reason under the FMLA. And for that reason, and that reason alone, it applies to employers who do not have 50 employees like the regular um, FMLA. It applies to all employers who have fewer than 500 employees. And it said the first two weeks of that type of leave would be unpaid, and the next 10 weeks would be paid at two-thirds of the employee's regular rate up to a maximum of $200 per day. Then there is another leave law within well, Let me just that digest act. that one for a second. Sure. So mm -hmm. Essentially it applies because anybody with a child right now has no school or no daycare. So they, I mean, there's a few exceptions. So an employee could say, I cannot work, I am home with my child. They, the employee would make the determination about whether they could work at home. Not exactly. So because this came out after the situation really got to the point of having stay at home orders and schools closed, you had a lot of situations where people continued to work after the school closed. So you have to say, well, if you continue to work after the school closed, well, what has changed? And the employee has to certify that they are needed, that there's no one else available to take care of the child. And if the child is over 14, um, they also need to say if there is a special circumstance that requires the employee to be home during daylight hours to take care of that child. Okay. So there are some limitations. And if you were furloughed before these acts came into place or even after these acts came into place, then the reason that you're not working is not because you're staying home with that child whose school is closed. The reason you are staying home is because there's no work for you, and therefore you would not qualify. And I'm getting that question a lot, where employers tried to keep employees on or keep them furloughed, and all of a sudden now they're saying, well, I want this leave because I'm home taking care of my kid. But, but we furloughed you. We shouldn't have to also pay this. And that is true, okay? It really That's is a but for standard on the causation. Yeah. All right, thank you. You said mm -hmm. part two. So the other type of leave under the new law is designed to coordinate in a way with the expansion of the FMLA leave in that one of the reasons you can take this other leave is the same, to care for a child who's home because the school is closed. and it could coordinate so that it could cover that first two weeks of unpaid under the expanded family and medical leave. But it is the employee's choice whether to use this leave to pay for that first two weeks or not. They're not required to use it. And the reason for that is that there are a bunch of other reasons that this leave could be used. And those other reasons include things like, I've been told I have to quarantine by some government health official. I've been told I have to quarantine because of a healthcare provider telling me either I have COVID or I likely have COVID, or I have some symptoms and I'm seeking some sort of medical diagnosis, um, or I have someone at home that I have to care for because they have been told they have to quarantine because they have it or they have a high risk or something like that. So there are several other reasons for taking it. So someone may say, gosh, I don't want to take that leave for the first two weeks because I'm staying home with my child because I want to make sure I have it available in case I get sick 
or in case um, I'm, I get exposed to someone and I'm told I have to stay home. So there are some reasons an employee might say, I don't want to use that. I still want to have my job protection under the first leave while we talked about, but I'm not going to get paid. So it is their choice and an employer can't require. And then, as I mentioned, there are these other reasons that it can be taken. Three of those reasons under this leave law could be at full pay up to a maximum of, I believe it's around $511 per day. And those are the reasons that relate to the individual. So I'm having symptoms and I'm trying to get a medical diagnosis. I've been told that I have to self-quarantine by a healthcare provider or by a government official. So it's a little bit different. It still has the two thirds of the employee's compensation as the rate if it is for staying home to take care of someone else or staying home because the child's school is closed. And, how, and we are told some of it is refundable. Like we've heard that your payroll tax is refundable, but that is such a small portion of what the employee cost. What else might be refundable? So, yeah, actually what it is, is it's designed to cover the full cost of it, but it does it by first saying you look at your payroll and you look at the payroll taxes that you would be depositing to the federal government, and you can hold back as much of those as would have, you would need to to cover what you're paying the other employees who are out. And then if that doesn't cover it, then there's a form you submit, and they say they're going to give you a refund um, for the rest of it, and they're going to try to process those within a two-week turnaround because at first there were some real serious issues on cash flow there. So the idea is that it would be fully covered even if it's not, there's not enough there to offset. Nice. That is very clear. That is the, a very clear explanation. So the risk to the employer is just a few weeks, and let's call it more than a few weeks because they're slow, but it's cash flow risk to the employer, not a new financial obligation that won't be reimbursed. That is correct. That's how <clears throat> it is designed. Awesome. <clears throat> let's talk about, this is all, <laughs> thank you for your time today. Mm -hmm. Y'all, this is... Um, uh, Natalie from our uh, law firm partner who has been the Chamber's General Counsel for a long time, uh, Brooks Pierce, and we're grateful for your time. And when we share information about this um, sort of webinar, we'll have your contact and your firm's contact information as well. Um, let's talk about PPP. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. The key questions that we've been getting about <clears throat> PPP. Um, well, I'll start with since Bridget's on the phone, one of the problems in PPP is how nonprofits are to apply. So a bank is telling Bridget, Bridget, we know that nonprofits, 501c3s, I'm sorry, are eligible to apply, not C6s, not C4s, just C3s. But the bank is saying, well, we need your 940s. And she says, I don't have nonprofits don't produce a nine, not a, a 941. We don't have this. We don't have a FUTA, a federal unemployment tax obligation. We can't give you that form. And the bank says, I can't process it without that form. Do you have advice uh, on that issue? Um, I might just, I have, I, Bridget, will you describe it? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of clarify a little bit. So I'm going through Bank of America and the way they've got it set up is you have to do everything um, through like online. And a so portal. there's no, a portal, there's no way to talk to an individual to explain my situation. And they basically sent me a list of three different categories we could fall into and what documents we need to submit, but we don't fall neatly into any of those categories for the reason Aaron just gave. I mean, the, the main category for most businesses we would fit into except for the fact that we don't have a 940. Thoughts? So my thoughts are um, work with one of the local banks um, because 
No local bank is taking any, no bank that we are aware of is taking any new customer on this. They've all said uh, an existing okay. relationship. Only existing relationships. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have an answer for you. If you can't talk to somebody, I mean, you can't produce something you don't have. You could potentially, I guess, when, they, when you go online, is it asking you to type in the information or upload the document? Upload the document. So, I mean, the one thought I had last night is that I could take a 940 form and just write across it, we are 5013C, we don't file this, and upload that. Yeah, that's good. That's, that was going to be my recommendation, okay. is if you're required to upload something, then upload the explanation. Okay. Perfect. And Bridget, mm -hmm. you might check in with other, non other nonprofits that have received this. The Art Center got their PPP, the money's in. Uh, community Works got their PPP, the money's in. So, <clears throat> so I think the difference there is that they actually have bankers they can talk to. That's my understanding. No, they had portals also. I think, okay. yeah. Did they? Okay. Okay, well, yeah, I'll definitely check in with them then. That's a good idea. We, well, they all had portals. Mm -hmm. We may have also had banks, but every bank is using some uploading requirement. Joel, do you have different information on that from the CPA side? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I... Hold on, you I guys, have, I'm going to... I'll unmute you. I'm going to do your... Try it this way. Go ahead. Okay, much better. Okay. Yeah, I've had clients having all kinds of problems um, getting information to banks, banks asking for information that some of them, you know, have no idea what it is. Um, and... Um, and I, I can't even tell you what banks are, are working well. Uh, I know the smaller banks, I've, I've seen more success. Um, but um, I've had a couple of clients get, um, get the PPP money from, from the bigger banks. And I know it's a challenge. Um, and I think that's why some of these big companies stole that money because they had all the accountants and attorneys on staff that had the business relationships with the banks and they grabbed that money before any of our little guys had a chance. <clears throat> the, the franchise exception. But yeah. to the question that Bridget asked, we, the advice that we have also been getting, I'll use the idle loan application as an example. The idle loan application, which was appropriate for nonprofits, had a place where you had to put the owner's name in and nonprofits had no owner. And they had to put the owner's birthday and the owner's social security number. And the advice the SBA gave us was to simply type, we are a nonprofit without an owner in first name, and we are a nonprofit without an owner in last name, and make up 0000, 000, 000, 000 social security numbers. I mean, it was, so uh, Natalie's advice is upload a 940. It's either blank or it has an explanation on it. Um, and then let's see if we can find you a banker to speak with. Sorry, Joel, I didn't need to do that. Go ahead, Joel. No, I was just going to say, fill in the blanks, apply something so that they can at least, uh, you've responded to it because they're making these so automated, unless you dot the I's and cross the T's digitally, you won't get through. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank so you. that was one of our PPP questions. The other PPP question is about when folks get the money, what the obligation to spend it is. It seems they must spend it within eight weeks of closing. They are worried that they now have it, but they are closed. So we have a coffee shop that got the money. They had 31 employees. They're closed. I mean, they're doing curbside. There's no reason for 31 people. So some folks have said, well, hire everybody back, even if they're not working. What if you mm -hmm. hire 10 people back the, what I spent on the 10 is forgivable, is that correct? Can you describe broadly how, what a, once you have it, what you should do with it, or the requirements? Okay. So my understanding is that the eight week period they're looking at starts when you get your disbursement. So once you have the money in hand, that's when the eight weeks starts. When you have to use it on payroll, the idea is to keep money going into people's pockets so that they're not out their money. So you can do a number of different things. 
when you talk about bringing people back, the first question I have would be, did you furlough them, meaning you did not separate the employment relationship, you're still paying their benefits, those sort of things. If you furloughed them, they're still your employees. So you can just pay them, whether they're working or not. You can ask them to come back and work. You can ask them to come back and do things that may not be their, quote, normal job, but do other things. I talked with one employer who had employees furloughed, got the PPP money, and he is probably going to talk with the employees about what they would be comfortable doing to serve the community and then pay them to do community service. So essentially, he's paying their payroll. The work he has asked them to do would be delivering meals or working at the food pantry or something like that. He has to go through all of his insurance issues and work that out and confirm it's okay for him to do that. But the point is that you don't have to have them working physically doing the same jobs they were doing before because they may not be there. Now, if they have been laid off, meaning the employment relationship has been terminated, you'll have a little trickier situation because you'll want to reach out to your employees and explain that you have this. If there's work for them to do, it's the same process with the furlough or whether there's not. Um, but if you're going to try to make payments to them, you have to rehire them. And they may not have an interest in being rehired, because they may be getting more money through unemployment with the federal supplement. That creates a real difficulty for the employers who are trying to spend the PPP money appropriately. Mm -hmm. The difference being if you were furloughed, then you're still mine. I can pay you the money and you have an obligation to report it. It will impact how much you're getting unemployment wise or whether you qualify but you're still mine. I still have that right to pay you. The laid off, separated, terminated employees, a different situation. Now, if you offer them employment and you offer to pay them, in theory, they should get disqualified for unemployment. But I don't know how that's all going to play out right now because there's just not good communication. The system's overwhelmed. I don't know what's going to happen there. We're but told, the employer and the uh, go ahead yeah the, the the governor said in the revision of unemployment for the state purposes you no longer have to look for work so when they on their mm -hmm. weekly basis testify they i'm told they don't have to say i've been offered i think they have to say i have not accepted or have not been paid so they could refuse right. your offer and continue to get unemployment yeah, I think we have set up that situation. Um, but as, and as an employer, you don't want to tell employees or threaten employees in any way. But I think it's fair for an employer to say, if I am asked, I will have to report that I offered you employment at this rate of pay. That's all they can say. Can a um, furloughed employee or any employee say, just like in a regular work environment, if I've hired someone to work the front desk and I tell them their new job is a forklift operator, they could say, yeah. I don't desire to be, I, that's not what you hired me for. You can't make me be a forklift operator. My job description says I work the front desk. If they work for yep. us at a coffee shop and we tell them now they have to build habitat houses in order to get employment, can they not quit? And if they did quit, are they eligible for unemployment? They're not eligible for unemployment. Is that correct? Uh, no, actually, if there has been such a substantial change to the job, um, it could it could be a situation where they are still eligible for unemployment. But the difference there is that if you're a furloughed employee and you're talking about, well, I don't want to go do that. What I'm telling people is you got to think of it as a Almost like when you go through the accommodation process with the ADA, it's that interactive process. Treat this like an interactive process where you two come together and you brainstorm ideas and how to make this work because 
the employees that you really want are the ones who look at this longer term and say, I know, longer term, I want a job. And if there's health insurance in play, if you're saying, I'm trying to come up with a way to keep you and pay you, and let's figure that out, and they say, I don't want to, then I have to separate your employment. I'm no longer going to pay my portion of the health insurance. It's going to be a COBRA event. Just make sure they understand the implications of, I'm going to separate the employment then. And that's going to be a different situation. There may not be a job here for you long term then when you decide you are ready to come back. So let's so talk about the hopefully eight weeks, um, on the eight weeks in the forgivable portion. So mm -hmm. you had 30 employees, you hire 10 of them back and you pay them the same. That would seem to mean that one third of what you got would be forgivable, plus the rent and the other calculations that we know are in there, right? I don't know that it's quite that simple because what they're going to do is they're going to compare what your payroll situation and your headcount situation look like um, during that eight week period to, um, I think there are a couple February. different periods that they look at. Yeah, I mean, you've got a couple different time frames that they can pick to look at and compare. And basically, if you've reduced it by more than 25% of that comparable, um, then it's going to start reducing what you can get forgiven. So it's not going to be quite as pure as you've described it. It's going to be a little more complicated. And I wish I could tell you more about it and how it's going to work. But really, until we have that guidance, uh, we're all kind of guessing. And so uh, the advice I give is, do what it appears the intent was, which was try to keep as many people on your payroll at the same pay rates as you can. And as soon as we get the guidance about whether that, then you're looking at individual payrolls, meaning did you keep this person, like 10 people getting paid $100 a day versus five people getting paid $200 a day, can you manipulate it that way or not we don't know yet so we are recommending that as much as possible until we get that guidance mirror what you had get as many people headcount wise at similar rates as you can we've had some questions like we'll use that they have 10 employees they only have work for two of them so two return to work and the other eight get paid for not working. They're working through equity issues that if they're all making the same as they made before, two having to work yep. for it, eight at home not working for it. Any advice on? My advice would be it, it does seem that if you keep your head count the same and you're paying everybody um, the people who are actually at work, you could increase their pay rate during that time because you would still be able to show that you're using that money for the right things and it should come out as forgivable. So creating some sort of equity in that way. Uh, many people have asked us, do their 1099 employees count as payroll? Our advice has been no, they are their own employer and they should apply for themselves for PPP money. Is that accurate? That's my understanding that because those independent contractors have the ability to apply for a loan on their own, that you cannot count them as your payroll um, for your PPP. What questions do folks have? Joel, what questions do you have? Bridget, Todd, Annette? Go ahead. I'm going to unmute your, not your, you have two devices. I'm going to unmute the other. Yeah, because well, I have no video on my uh, yes, okay. monitors. But anyway, um, I have one client who he's the only employee. But in 19, he had other employees. And um, he's thinking that he's 
just increase his salary to get to 75% to have it be forgivable. And this is not a, a stupid guy. He actually read through the law and doesn't see anything preventing him from doing that. You have mentioned, and I've spoken to Bob about this too, is we don't really have a clear understanding of exactly how they're going to calculate forgivability. So, I mean, I told them do it, and the worst that'll happen is you'll end up with some portion of it as a 1% loan over two years. I agree. Um, there's, there is that guidance just does not exist yet. And when you purely read what we do have available, you could come to that reasonable conclusion. Absolutely. Um, yeah. May I ask, um, regarding the clock starting for the eight weeks is a big concern. Many businesses are hoping because the stay at home orders are extending, they want as much of that payroll to be at a time in which they are open. Um, let's just use retailers or restaurants or others. If they close on their loan, but tell the bank, I decline disbursement, I prefer not to. The bank says, please close on this loan. If not, we may not have the money for you. But if they closed on the loan and the bank held on to it and they didn't disperse it for weeks and weeks, would that delay their clock? So I believe that there are actually requirements that it has to be dispersed within a certain period of time. I don't remember exactly what those are, but it's a relatively short window. So I don't think that that works. Uh, it is just unfortunate that they have it at the wrong time and that they can't delay. We are advising some of them who got rent um, forgiveness. They might have gotten April and May's rent forgiven to contact their landlord and say, I'll pay you April and May's rent. May I have June and July's forgiven? Because if I pay April and May rent, it will be included in this forgivable portion. Um, mm -hmm. But it won't be if it is outside of the eight weeks. So there is um, some back and forth happening there as well. Is that, act, is that your understanding as well? It all has to happen in the eight weeks. Yes, that is my understanding. Uh, although Joel makes a good point, if it doesn't happen in the eight weeks, you have a two-year loan at 1% interest with six months of not having to pay it. Exactly. Right. And the loan is to your bank and not to the federal government. So conceivably, you could have additional conversations with your bank. Uh, <laughs> at the end? Possibly. <laughs> the, the situation is this. Um, as with a lot of loans, loans get sold. You know, there are a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. So whether that loan will stay at the bank it starts at is unknown. Um, so I would not count on necessarily that. Um, but one of the things that I think is an option is that you get the loan the other thing that can happen is if you're uncomfortable having that loan over a period of time is what you did not use, there's no penalty for paying it off at the end of the week, eight weeks. So just simply paying it back as much of it as you didn't use or didn't get forgiven is certainly an option. There's no penalty for that. We're advising everybody to keep their PPP money in a open a new bank account if you have to, but keep this money separate from the rest just to uh, enhance your ability to do processing and keep up with the, what you spent it on. Exactly. And I, I think even further, um, we've seen employers who are breaking their um, payroll apart. So if their pay period part of it was at the beginning before their disbursement then the date of their disbursement when their eight weeks starts they're paying people in two separate checks essentially so that there is a clean documentation of the payroll <clears throat> excuse me that it is within that eight week period rather than trying to create some way to show, well, our pay period was this two weeks and this much of it goes into this. They're actually trying to 
break that apart into separate checks so it's all very clear. So things like you're talking about, putting that money in a separate bank account, anything you can do to keep the clear separation of those expenses and that money coming in is great advice. What other questions do folks have for Natalie? Rebecca, oh. will you put Natalie's, either her LinkedIn in the chat, will you drop in uh, Brooks Pierce? When you, when you Google an attorney, they're hard to odd find. You all have these pages that exist on the ABA site and sometimes on your firm site and sometimes LinkedIn. So we're going to try to give people some good contact information for you. Uh, what other questions? Are there? Yeah, the website is the easiest, brookspierce.com. And it's pretty easy to find us there. Um, I just have one more question of clarification on the Family First Act. Um, so my um, employer, we just have four employees. So we're so under the Do you 50. have employees or do you have contractors? We have four who are employees and then okay. we have contractors as well. So um, two of them potentially could take advantage of the Families First Act because they have um, children that are five and under that they're trying to take care of while they're working. Um, you know, so I told them I'd just try to get more information about that, but are, are we required as that small business to offer that um, or not? So one of the things when the reason is to care for the child, um, the way that it's written is that it's a but for. So if you have a way that they can continue working and provide that care, um, maybe you can be flexible in the hours that they work. Maybe um, you can have some of the work done at home, whatever it is. So it may be that their situation ends up, well, I'm entitled to this 12 weeks, but it could run out longer because maybe you only need to use it at, you know, four hours of it at a time or, um, and I think the way they've done it is they want it used in full days if possible. Um, so we may have to look at that just to clarify, but you could say, well, if you could come on Mondays and Wednesdays and work from home on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but you have that flexibility to work it out with that employee. As long as you both agree, you don't have to just say it's all or nothing. You're either working full time or you're home full time. You have some flexibility there with that particular type of leave to work it out. Did okay. you not say that the employer would say to the employee, you've been doing this just fine for five weeks uh, working from home. What happened now that you require mm -hmm. this medical, this family leave? And the employee would have to say something new has happened. Or the, could the employee say, well, I've, I've always had trouble with this? So um, the Department of Labor did not give us clear guidance on this issue. So we are advising people, though, you do have an obligation to the IRS because you're going to claim that you should get this um, tax credit. You have an obligation to make sure that you are doing this correctly. And so if an employee has been working just fine and suddenly now says, I can't, it seems like you have some obligation just to confirm, to have done your due diligence that in fact something has changed. It's going to be easy for the employee because the easy answer is, gosh, it's been fine until now, but my kid is really behind and end of the year is coming up and I'm just going to have to be home supervising this homework. You know, that's going to be legitimate probably. Um, can you say, you know, it wasn't fine before I was making it work, but my kid's falling behind. Um, you're probably going to have to, you're probably going to have to be pretty lenient on whatever the reason the employee comes up with. If the, um, principal way this is paid back is through a rebate of your federal unemployment tax, how would an organization Correct. that has no federal unemployment tax get refunded it? <laughs> yeah, well, they say that it's going to be whatever you can't withhold hold back that they're going to refund. And so we have to just kind of let it play out and see what happens. 
we have sometimes found that the tax credits around uh, FUTA refunds for nonprofits are odd because uh, the feds will say, I'm sorry, you don't even pay this tax, let alone um, yeah. ask us to forgive it. Okay, this is an interesting thing. I mean, for many organizations that have had employees, it seems that they can request from the feds partial reimbursement for what they've been paying their employees while their employees were caring for children. After the effective date of the act, yes. But it has to be the reason. Um, it can't, it, it, then they really set it up as a but for reason. That that's the reason you can't work. Can't be that the work's unavailable. But in our, like, let's just use, uh, we have an, um, our policy allows someone to take time off and be paid to care for a child already. So would not an employee simply be taking their own leave and not this new federal leave? Did that make sense? So the new leave is in addition to any leave that was previously available. Got it. So Definitely with awesome. respect to that first two weeks, Got it. that is <laughs> not concurrent. Now, they could say, and if the employer is willing to allow it, the employee could say, but I'd like to get my full pay and then use whatever leave they had with the employer to make up the difference, but the employer would only get the tax credit for the two thirds. Then when it switches, if it goes on past two weeks and it switches over to the other type of leave, then the employer could say, well, you have this leave available and we think that you should use it. Um, then you, again, it's the same sort of situation where you can use it, but you only get the two thirds credit. This has been an incredibly helpful period of uh, conversation with you. While attendance was light, the uh, emailing out of a link to some of the information you've shared will be incredibly helpful uh, for many others. Uh, we have several organizations that have the questions I asked you or the questions they've been asking us and we look forward to sharing with them what you said. Any final comments? Thank you for the time you've given us today. Yeah, no, I so appreciate much. the opportunity to be here. Well, we are very, very grateful for you. Um, I'm so thankful for Brooks Pierce for over a decade now has been uh, general counsel for our chamber, both in Artie Bolick and in Bob Saunders, sort of back and forth over time. Um, very glad to have you today. Anybody else? We can help. Comments? Uh, if not, please accept our, our deep appreciation, Natalie, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. All right. Bye. Thanks, everybody.